Welcome everyone to Successful Toy Podcast. A big thank you to our audience watching on Facebook and YouTube and to those tuning in on WWRCK Radio, Spotify, Listen Notes, Amazon Music, Samsung Podcast, and Podcasts Index. Your support means the world to us and we're thrilled to have you join us. Let's dive into today's special episode. Hi, y'all. Hi. We're back with another episode, and I have Anne with me today, and we're going to get into hella business. <laughs> so introduce yourself to the people, Anne. <laughs> I am Anne Oikel, and I live in Canada, and I literally have been on a little bit of a journey, which has led me to being a solopreneur, um, helping people really get out of where they're stuck and really look at their how they think feel and act i like i like so now i was reading through your bio i was like Ooh, this is interesting so let's get into it you ready i'm ready when you are <laughs> okay can you des- can you describe how your parents was on education with you that influenced your career choices and your drive for success in various um, male dominant industries? Well, that's a good one because <laughs> I grew up with all boys. <laughs> I'm the youngest of four initially, so my parents, both of them, actually only had a grade eight education, so they always encouraged us to do more and be better. And uh, growing up with four Mm -hmm. older boys, two who were sick, actually, and passed away when I was younger. So ended off being two boys other than dad and mom. And uh, so it was a very male dominated environment at home. So that's where I was comfortable. Um, I know when I say I worked in a male dominated environment most of my life, some people take that as a negative thing. It was actually not a negative thing for me because that's what I knew. That's how I function. So it was definitely a positive thing for me (laughs) being a female. It was tough because back, especially in the early 90s, um, there was that still that stereotypical, the men made more than the women. Um, So that was still there. It was Mm -hmm. still prevalent. But I had a lot of support from men and women throughout my career. So I always tend to gravitate to the male dominated industries. And now that I'm working independently on my own, I'm more drawn to the female industry. So it's funny because I have a lot of strong masculine energy, (laughs) but yet I still I'm female and I have uh, I'm kind of balancing that that whole energy piece out now that I'm in my older years. (laughs) It's crazy that you say that because like how you saying nowadays you have more women doing men jobs. Like you have women out here being construction workers, working in the warehouse, doing heavy, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's crazy when you, when you labeled yourself as um, dominant in the male industry, it's like, I can relate to that. And it's sometimes, I ain't gonna say sometimes all the time it's like us women is more dominant than the man these days. That's crazy, right? I'm being biased. Yeah. In my very first job, my <laughs> boss said to me, I'm hiring you because you grew up with all boys. You know how to handle the men. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. And it's so crazy because I don't work in an environment where it's predominantly men. But when it comes to the women, we work harder than the men. And the supervisors and the management be saying that like, dang, y'all cry more than the females do. We ask the females to do something. They do it with no talking back, no none of that. Y'all, y'all want to talk back. Y'all want to cry about it, complain. Like, it's crazy. It's like they don't want to work no more or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's (laughs) things are shifting for sure. (laughs) Yes, big time. Reflecting on your early family life and the challenges faced by your parents, how did those experiences shape your perspectives? Per, sorry, perceptions of resilience are overcoming adversities. You know what? That even that shifted over the years. So going through what we went through with the boys passing early on, like I was five and eight when they passed. Um, and then when I was 23, mm-hmm. my mom passed. So experiencing half the family really leaving us completely at early ages was a challenge in itself, not just for my parents and how they shaped me, but they really 
they really impressed on us to, you know, enjoy life, but find, you know, your, your peace and your joy. But there was also that turmoil in that message that you got to go, you got to work hard, you got to do this, you got to do that. So having so many people leave me early on due to death, I didn't realize it, but I embodied my own messaging that if I get too close to anybody, they're going to die. So I started keeping people at bay Um, in my earlier years. And it really shaped how I, how I function in society, because I'm very, you know, high energy. (laughs) I'm very jovial. But at Mm -hmm. the same time, when I get angry, look out, (laughs) because I had that male presence. And um, I even had like previous coworkers refer refer to me, you're the nicest bitch I ever met. (laughs) Because I could be that soft (laughs) person, but I could be that nasty bitch if you piss me off. (laughs) So there was- I swear to God, I could be here. And it's always been a struggle uh, having that balancing act. Um, But it really made Mm -hmm. me resilient. It made me realize that, you know, for me, checking out was never an option. Like my mother had already buried two of us. (laughs) And I could never imagine doing that to someone. So for me, checking out was never an option. But because it was never an option, it made me dig my heels in and push and fight even harder. So whenever I had adversity, no matter what I went through, I still dug my heels in, I still dug deep and pushed and pulled my way out. And, you know, at back in those days, I didn't realize that I had control over how I think, feel and act, I was highly (laughs) impacted and, you know, really influenced by what was going on around me. So with having so much death or having, because everybody knows it comes in waves. So when you start to experience trauma, it tends to come in waves. So it's almost like we're being tested. How much can we really endure? So my parents used to always say the power of three. Is it always, if there was a death, it's like there was three in a row. If, If there was any kind of negativity or impact, it was three in a row. So, you know, and it, it kind of fit the bill, but we were always taught like pull, push, pull, get yourself out. But I still didn't realize in my earlier years that I can control how I think about the situation, how I feel about the situation and how to react against the situation. I always let my environment dictate how I reacted. I didn't think I had control over them because when stress or anything hit, I'd be like, (laughs) I'd be the zombie. I'd be like, don't come near me because I'm a, I'm a ticking time bomb when I get highly stressed over stuff like that. So now learning what I've learned and being able to transition, it's like now when trauma hits, I I handle things completely different. It doesn't affect my life for near as long. It doesn't impact me for near as long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people talk about the power of positivity. It's more than just thinking positive. Like, let's face it, when you're dealing with a death or an illness or anything, you can't always think positive. <laughs> like, no matter what people right. say that you still going to have that impact, but how you process that is going to change. You know, instead of looking at what I would have done in the past is looked at what's going on and fell into that victim mode and have it affect me for God knows how long. Mm -hmm. Now it hits. Okay, it's here. What can I learn from it? I can't change it. I can't do anything about it. It's beyond my control. But how can I think and how can I feel and how can I act going forward? And things don't impact me near as long. You know, when when stuff comes up in my life now, I look at it. If I need to cry, I cry. I get it over with. <laughs> but I look at it and say, OK, yeah. what where do we go from here? What are the positive points of this whole situation? Because there is always positive points at some point. And where can the gratitude be found in what I'm being presented with? Because when that hits, that's the time to learn. So what can I learn from it? How can I grow from it? How can I help impact others from it? Mm hmm. I totally feel that because I used to be the type of person too. I let the environment control my emotions and how I feel. But now I have control over that. And I tell myself like, no, it's OK to cry. But when you cry, get up, continue with your life because you can't change it. Like, you know, certain things when they come to death, brother, it's nothing we can do. We can't change it. We can't bring them back. So it's either you got to continue on with your life or what you want to do. Take care. Yeah. So yeah, and finding I, the I gratitude. Totally in the time that you had. Yeah, finding the gratitude in the time yeah. that you had, and 
knowing that they were here for a purpose and respecting and understanding that and finding the gratitude, like gratitude is everything now. <laughs> it's like the go-to. It's the minute I feel down and out over anything. It's like, okay, where's the gratitude? Where's the learning in this? And how can I grow from it? And even myself, like I'm unable to take a lot of medication. So now, like I, if I end up with an infection, I can't go to the doctor and get antibiotics or penicillins because my body rejects it. <laughs> it's like, not happening. Oh, so wow. I got to find ways to make sure I yeah. stay healthy and heal. So I got into, I, I was introduced to cellular health. And when I researched it, it was like, oh my God, like this is impacting my body at the foundational level. And if it helps keep me healthy and mm -hmm. helps me heal faster, I don't need any of that stuff. So literally I, I sliced right. the edge off my thumb here not that long ago and I healed it up in like seven to 10 days, completely healed. And, you know, normally I'd be using peroxide and polysport and, you know, there's high risk of it getting infected because I'm using my hands all the time. And there was no sign and no, mm -hmm. it just heals so fast having the cellular health support my body. And like I say, there's so many things I can't control, but that's something I can control. So being able to add that to my system and help support my body, as well as the mental health of being able to now transition and restructure how I look at life and look at challenges. And it ultimately boils down to foundational of the body and how we think, feel and act. So for people who don't know, can you give us a little background of solar health? What is that? What so it does? This, yeah. So cellular health, um, I got introduced to this company. It's called ASEA and it's redox molecules. So our body naturally produces redox anyway. Like that's what keeps us healthy naturally. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are meant to heal themselves. So when we're younger and when we're healthy, you know, our bodies are working at their optimal and redox is constantly flowing through our body. So our redox molecules that our body produces now is responsible for the bulk of our functionality. We have over 75 trillion cells in our body and the redox mm -hmm. is responsible for regeneration, the signaling of the cells, so when we start to get sick, it's the redox that kicks into the immune system and tells the immune system, go to battle. <laughs> and the challenge is, is that once we once we hit puberty, our bodies shift and change. So they they tell us that at that stage, every decade, we're losing about 10 percent of our cellular regeneration. So when you think about it, our redox mm -hmm. molecules in our own bodies and how it's functioning and how it's supposed to work is starting already to disintegrate and we're starting to age at that point. And by adding more redox mm -hmm. molecules, and so far this is the only company out there that has been able to come close enough to mimicking the redox that's in our bodies. I'm not joking. It's as natural as it can get. It doesn't interfere with any medications because it's mm -hmm. made from salt and water. It's purified water, refined salt, goes through what's now a nine patented process. There's over a thousand trade secrets and they secure it in a bottle mm -hmm. and it took them about five years, but they came out with a topical gel as well. So when I slice my thumb, not only do I drink it every day, which is adding cells to my body and supports my natural health. But when I slice my thumb or if I have a topical injury, um, especially with my thumb, I'll dip it in the liquid that I drink and I keep applying the gel uh -huh. nonstop throughout the day. And I what would normally be a three to four week healing process was completely healed in seven to ten days. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I never heard of the business, but yeah, they need to get yeah. more exposure because I never heard of that. Yeah. Well, so they're starting to you get mentioned feeling so Yeah. Good. You mentioned feeling safe in a male dominant environment due to your upbringing with four brothers. How did this dynamic impact your professional relationships and leadership style? Wow. <laughs> that is a good question. Um, <laughs> when it comes to leadership style early on, I was very aggressive, very dominant. Um, so being able, being in that mode, I was able to learn to dial it back a bit and find, especially in today's society, because we're, as humans, we're shifting a how we communicate and, and work together. So back in the day, the domination was normal. And now it's considered abuse. <laughs> so it's a very fine line of being able to transition from being such a dominant personality that I learned growing up to finding that softer side and being mm -hmm. able to 
yes, be assertive, but also be nurturing and being able to come at it from both angles to be able, if you have to put your foot down, you can do it in a nicer, softer way <laughs> versus then being mm -hmm. so aggressive, you're blowing people out of the water. <laughs> right. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Experience top-notch hairstyling wherever you are. Diverse Styles, your go-to traveling stylist based in North Carolina, specializes in braids, sew-ins, plaits, and locks. Follow at Diverse Styles LLC on Instagram and book your appointment today for a fresh and fabulous look. Despite internal success, you face internal struggles. Can you share how these challenges affected your mental health and your approach to personal well-being? 100%. So especially during the younger years, because I had such a jovial personality and especially dealing with my mom's death at 23, like that was the icing on my cake at that point. And as humans, we mask what's going on internally. It's that's what we do. We're masters at it. So unless somebody is really good reading the external dialogue, nobody gets it. And I was going through life, going through work, happy go lucky, laughing everything off. And I have signature laugh. I tried to patent it, but it doesn't work. <laughs> but literally, I would laugh it off. And you could literally, if you knew me really well, you could pick up on the different versions of the laughs and what they meant. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you could tell if something was just oh. funny. You could tell if it was sarcastic. You could tell if it was fear-based. You could tell if it was, get out of my way. <laughs> so you could learn the different <laughs> types of laughs that I had and navigate through what I was going through internally. But most people didn't have that skill. So just like everyone else, I would mask it. So I experienced depression, which freaked me out because my mom was on antidepressants and the little bit I knew about antidepressants at the time, I was petrified of antidepressants and drugs. Um, the drugs that my brothers were on because they had a genetic um, deficiency had actually stunted their growth and affected their body. So I really did not like drugs. And um, when I found out my mom was on antidepressants, I said to myself, there ain't no way in hell I'm ever going on antidepressants in this lifetime. <laughs> not happening. So yeah, I would mask it, but masking it, it, it still builds up and comes to an explosive point. And my explosive point was, okay, either I have to start taking care of myself mentally more than anything. And if I don't, then I'm going to be going into the medical system, going into psychiatry, psychologists, getting that sort of help. And for me, especially back then, I had a lot of misconstrued perceptions of that industry. So I knew there were some good doctors out there, but unfortunately for me, I had experienced personally uh, the people that I knew that had to go into those situations. Very few of them had positive outcomes right. versus negative. So I was scared to death of that industry. Now going through everything I've gone through and throughout my own transitional and personal journey, there are a lot of great psychologists and psychiatrists out there, and there still are some situations where you do see bad situations. But I'm to the point now where I didn't have to go down that route for myself. I did rely on it throughout my life with my own children, with, you know, mom and dad had to use them for us after the boys died. So there was some positivity there, but there was also more fear than than the non-fair aspects of that industry. So I vowed that I was gonna find a way to get myself healthy. So I sought after self-help groups, even at an early age. And I started my own journey mm -hmm. at an early age, but it would only get so far. And it wasn't until I was in my forties, we moved from Nova Scotia, Canada, out to Alberta, Canada. So over 5,000 kilometers away from family, friends, and we started a new life here. And it wasn't until I got here, I actually got introduced during COVID. So it was like fall of 2019 ish to a huge group of healers. And like these people were like aliens to me, <laughs> but I was so uh -huh. intrigued. I'm always so, yeah. I'm always so curious and, and inquisitive about things that I don't know and understand, especially of that realm that I started to mm -hmm. deep dive. I even gave a 
I was just talking about it. So I started to do a little bit more of a deep dive. I started to dive into Dr. Joe Dispenza's teaching. I dove into the ladies that I got connected to and what they do. I ended up learning Reiki levels one, two, and three. And I, before that, I didn't even know what Reiki was. I didn't even know it existed. And now I'm level three yeah. trained in Reiki. And so I really started to learn and evolve. And it wasn't until I was like 47 ish that I really started to deep dive into my own healing. And even though life was good, I still had a lot of behaviors I was totally unaware of. And it wasn't until then that right. I started to relax because I didn't realize I was a massive control freak. People talk about addictions and you think of drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. Well, control right. was my addiction was unreal and if it was something i couldn't control I was losing my shit <laughs> and that's where i got the reputation <laughs> I'm the next you, ever met. <laughs> you know what it don't matter how old we are for us to start healing because i'm with you i ain't start healing so i turned 45 <laughs> so yeah so it's you know it don't matter yeah, with I was the trailing right behind you like, it's okay you guys <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're here. And as long the as we're here, of family family members. Members. yeah. Yep. Yep. The loss of family members at a young age and the threat posed by your mother's first husband must have been incredibly challenging. How did these events influence your views on family and security? Wow. Yeah, a lot, actually. Um, so I didn't I wasn't aware growing up that my mom's first husband was such a threat. So three of the boys that I grew up with were from him, from her first marriage. And he had threatened to take me away. And I before I was even born and I didn't even know it until I was in my late teens, early 20s. So when I learned that information, I start I didn't realize it, but I started living in fear. So that's where part of the dominant personality really came out because who's going to really attack a female? I, I'm all a five foot nothing <laughs> walking down the street with an aggressive personality <laughs> and, you know, a force to be reckoned with. Like my energy radiated dominance and just exuded a lot of masculine energy. So, you know, my my attitude unconsciously became very aggressive, very dominant and I started to put on weight in my early 20s, right straight through. And I never really dieted to get it off because I knew a lot of people diets didn't work and people would yo-yo. So I was never even willing to dive into the psychological side of why is it here? And it wasn't until I started my healing journey, I realized that this is part of my safety and my security because nobody's going to pick up a 150 yeah. or 200 pound five foot woman. <laughs> versus 97 pounds when right. I was younger. And my dad even said that to us at the table one night. I remember this plain as day. We were having supper and I had like the, my brother who is my biological brother and closest to me in age. He's a big strap and burly boy. And um, we were sitting at the table and I think I was like 16 or 17 at the time. So I had no idea that this was even a threat. And I said to mom and dad at the table, I was like, why is it he can come and go as he pleases not a question asked. I even look at my shoes and I get, where do you think you're going? <laughs> well, my father, because I didn't know where it was coming from. He turned blood red because he was angry and he turned blood red and all he could say, and he wouldn't even look at me, just stared straight down the table. And all he could say was, he's a big strap and burly boy. He can take care of himself. He said, anybody can pick you up and carry you away. Because I was only like 97 pounds, maybe, <laughs> like maybe even less at that point. And, um, and that stuck with me. So packing on the weight during my early 20s, like once I left home and got out of that security, the weight became my security because psychologically unaware, there was safety in having weight on nobody's mm -hmm. going to pick this up and carry it away now. So and it's only been yeah, probably the last they, year or two that yeah. I've realized that and came to that conclusion. And it's been my blanket, like it's been my security is the weight and the attitude <laughs> like it's a package deal <laughs> but that was my security yeah. between my mouth between my mouth and my weight nobody was going to touch me <laughs> i'm surprised to even get married <laughs> right you weren't that bad was you well if your husband can handle you then you know he love you for real 100 <laughs> <100%. laughs> balance you 
<laughs> Balancing motherhood with high stress jobs. How did you manage stress and maintain your own well-being while supporting a child with high anxiety and learning challenges? You know what? That's been a tough one myself because if you're if you're not healthy yourself, you don't deal with those situations in a healthy way. We were doing the best we could and, you know, we there's nothing I regret. We're loving, caring parents. But knowing what I know now, I can honestly sit back and reflect to how I could have done things differently because there's a lot of things we didn't understand. And there's still things that we don't fully yeah. understand. Um, but that's been a tough navigation because, you know, especially as parents, you sometimes wonder and you question, where does this come from? She was such a young child when this was developed. Where did it come from? But Again, back then, we didn't understand how past lives can interfere, how energies coming from the, the womb can even interfere. And learning all this stuff, it helped me understand that, you know, she is a creature of her own habits as well. We've imprinted her 100% were her parents, but she's also been imprinted by so many other things. And just part of her own natural being was part of what developed her challenges. So mm -hmm. it's been a tough balancing act because when you're not 100% healthy yourself and you're never going to be 100% healthy, but when you're in the state we were in versus where we are now, it was a balancing act back then, but it's more so now because we understand more. So we think about how we're about to react to her versus just blowing up. So when she doesn't talk or answer somebody, it used to make us angry, but we didn't understand that it's because yeah. she was frozen. She couldn't speak. Now we understand that we still navigate how, what is the best way to deal with this? What is the, because if, if she was to meet you and you were to talk to her and then all of a sudden she, the social anxiety kicked in and she just clammed and you didn't know she had it. You'd yeah. think what a rude child. She's not answering me. Right. And, and that's what we struggled with was right, how right. Society was perceiving, but then we had to figure out, okay, this is our child. She can't speak. She's hurting. She's frozen because of social anxiety. And how do we navigate this now? How do we how do we heal this? How do we navigate through it? Because although I coach other people, I can't change anybody unless they want to change themselves. And especially my child, mm -hmm. <laughs> she doesn't want me to be her coach. So mm -hmm. I can't coach her. I cannot guide her the best way I know how. And oftentimes I've figured out to navigate through my husband because my husband's very quiet and he's very soft. So she actually has mm -hmm. a better relationship with him in some ways when it comes to some things. So when it comes to my aggressiveness and if she does, if she's not responding to me, I navigate through him because she'll listen and hear him. Right. And she'll, if he makes a recommendation, she's more apt to do it than she is with me. So now that we know that I navigate through him. So if I need her to do something or if I want her to do something, I shouldn't say need, if I want her to do something and I know she's not going to respond to me. I'll talk to him and, you know, get him on board. And if he agrees, he'll make the suggestion to her. And if he doesn't agree, we have the conversation of why. But for the most part, if there's something I want her to engage in or do, I'll get him to make the recommendation because she's more apt to hear and say yes to him than me. Because because her and I are like this, we're oil and water, two females, <laughs> dominant personality, non-dominant for her. It's yeah. been oil and water. So yeah. knowing she's going to say no to me just because it's me making the recommendation, I just back off now. Where before I didn't know how to back off. I was so controlling. I was just like, yeah. do it, kid. <laughs> and that didn't go well for anybody. Right. Like, it'll be going my way. Like, uh-huh. So, yeah, I feel it because it's like you more aggressive than your husband. So he's more calming and his energy is more soothing to her. So she going to listen to him compared to you yeah. because you guys going to argue or bump heads or something, you know. And it's not like she's been a rude teenager. It's just both of y'all are dominant. You want everything to go yeah. your way. And if it don't go your way. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. get it. We're going to we're going to go on a quick break and we'll be right back. Are you ready to show off your success? Elevate your style with our range of apparel and accessories from small to 5XL. We've got your shirts, hoodies and tumblers to match every size and taste. Shop your favorite items today at successful-toy.square.site slash and let your success shine.
So I have a question. Do you think that if you was to have someone else to coach your daughter, that she would relate to them more versus you doing it? That's exactly what we do. Because <laughs> you said, okay. I was like, you were saying you don't want to coach her because you know she's not going to listen oh, to you. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And the, that's what happened. That's like, good. I had my own coach. Yeah. And I had my own coach. And that was part of my barrier was I remember sitting here bawling to her. <laughs> I was like, how am I supposed to coach other people when I can't even, you know, raise my own child? And she's like, your child is not your ideal mm -hmm. client. And I was like, what? And then when she explained it to me, I was like, yeah, you're right. Like, she doesn't want me to coach her. So she's not going to be coachable. But anybody that comes into my field mm -hmm. that wants to learn what I have to offer they're going to be open to listen and adhere and take my guidance, my advice, my direction because they want it. She doesn't want it. So right. it was like, it's night and day. It's not even the same thing. So having that perspective was huge for me to be able to move forward, especially in a coaching business where I can coach other people and guide them, whether it be through their cellular health journey or their own personal development journey of how they think, feel, and act and being able to give them different perspectives of how they view things. I love that. Obtaining a black belt in karate at 47 is an impressive feat. What inspired you to pursue karate and how has this achievement influenced other areas of your life? You can thank my daughter for that one. <laughs> So because she has social anxiety, trying to get her involved in stuff was a challenge. So because when we went to the dojo um, to learn, we seen people of all ages, all walks of life at the dojo. And so it became a thing of, mom, I'll do it if you do it, thinking we'd be in the same class. So I was like, okay, sure. So for me, it was a socializing mm -hmm. thing. I'll, sure, I'll do it. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, whatever, I won't go through the yeah. ranks. I'll just come and be social. That's not how it works. <laughs> when you sign up for karate, <laughs> you have a class, you're learning. And because she was so young when she started karate, she was in the kids class and I ended up in the adult class. So we were, I was at the dojo five days a week and some, I'd say mm -hmm. at least one, if not two days, I can't remember one for sure. I was there twice because she had a five o'clock and I, the adult class was later on at night. Um, and so that's how mm -hmm. I got into karate. And of course, again, people back east with my personality, they're like, oh, my Lord, God help the Albertans. Not only do you now have an aggressive personality, but she's learning to hurt people physically <laughs> and learning properly to do it. <laughs> and I was like, it was funny, but <laughs> the karate, like I ended up stopping the karate during COVID. I got my black belt during COVID. And then when they closed everything down, that's when I stopped going because the black belt material was so much harder to learn online. So once mm -hmm. I obtained my black belt during COVID, I ended up not pursuing it any further, but I would like to get back to it. I do miss it because it took like two to three years to get to that point. So when you get, when you get to that stage, you're learning discipline. And what I've learned, especially through my healing journey, when you go into a dojo and you're learning karate or even some of the other ones, um, when you learn kata specifically, it's a series of movements. It's a moving mm -hmm. meditation. You get so focused. I noticed that when I, whenever I went there, I was so focused on what I'm there to do and learn that the outside world didn't exist outside those four walls. So for the hour, hour and a half I was mm. there, nothing existed. And I was 100% totally in the present, focused. And we would come out of class, although it's not high physical activity, you're constantly restraining your muscles and the movements. And especially as you move up in ranks, like all your movements are very specific. You get more precise. Like I got to the point where I could like literally throw a punch and come within in like centimeters of your hand or your face or whatever I was going to hit and not hit you because that's how well you train that's yeah. how well your muscles get and um you know so to I like I was I was still overweight but I was toned and because you condition your body I was like my legs and my arms could take a beating 
And when I first started, I would show up for work wearing t-shirts, all black and blue, because <laughs> I wasn't abused, so I didn't hide it. But people that didn't right. know me, they'd be like, say what's going on and I'm like oh it's just karate class it's fine I'm not abused it's just karate but you know people people who didn't know me would wonder because I'd go out in public and my arms because I would I would just give her <laughs> so my arms would be black yeah and blue you know, if I'm going I'm going 110 <laughs> percent and uh so it it taught so much discipline it taught you know conditioning it caught it taught what your very what your body was capable of enduring um was absolutely mm -hmm. just incredible to be able to go through that. Like if anybody wants to, to join anything, I would say join martial arts of some sort, find one that you like and enjoy. And I noticed I'm gravitated to like uh, Qigong and yoga because they mimic a lot of the movements that we learn in karate, especially Qigong. It's mm -hmm. basic soft movement of martial arts. So, let us know, explain to us when it when you receive the black belt, what is the black belt in karate? What does black that represent? Belt is, it is the first level of your highest achievement. So all the other belt ranks, black belt is the ultimate belt range, uh, belt rank when in martial arts. So getting your first degree black belt, from there you can work up to 10 degrees, but that takes time and it takes um, a lot of endured training. So it, it's a different level of training. So being able to achieve black belt was like, I didn't even think I'd get, when I first started karate, that wasn't even my goal. <laughs> I thought that was so far fetched. It wasn't right. even funny. <laughs> I thought that's a joke for me. Like I'm, I'm pushing I'm on like half a century here. <laughs> but it, it's very, <laughs> So the really black belt is the first level of high achievement. It's the first level of high ranking in martial arts. Got you. Starting your own business in health and well-being, indicating a significant shift in your career path. What motivates you to make this change and how does your business reflect your personal values? It was a little bit of a transition. So I was working for the industrial field, working pipeline stuff, and um, the pipeline industry slowed. So it, it turned out to be a perfect transition out of that into this. So I, would, I was working with my coach developing the program while I was still working in the industrial world. So with that slowing down naturally, it, it enabled me to just transition into this. And it's been... It's been really good because it, it mimics my values better than working in that industry, so to speak. So when you're working for someone else in a very strong, powerful industry like that, your values are not always front and center, so to speak. You know, you're working for someone else. You have to endure whatever is happening within that company and within their values. So if there's any misalignment, you either deal with it and let it go or you find another company to work for. So being able to transition out of that and really honing into my own stuff and completely different industry allowed me to really step into where my values truly lie. Being able to help other people and, you know, care for them and walk them through and have that empathy and just that touch of you can get through this and it's, it's, you can transition, you can change if you want to, you know, the old adage that people don't change is basically BS. You, that is true. People will not change and do not change unless they choose to, but once they choose to, anybody can change. Yeah. And it's, it is a choice. It's not it, like we can't help those that don't want to change because they won't change. But um, mm -hmm. it's really fit into my values because it allows me to really practice what I preach and I can do it more authentically and freely. There's no there's nobody else telling me what I can and cannot do and how to do it. Mm -hmm. How do you incorporate your love for nature, animals and stargazing into your daily life and family time? And how do these passions help you recharge <laughs> that is my recharge i am surrounded by animals i have two dogs a cat a cockatiel in my house <laughs> and i live on a three acre <laughs> property <laughs> 
So on the three acre property, we've got wildlife. Do you have horses everywhere. And stuff? I don't have horses. I just no, want to ask you that. Do you? <laughs> My daughter would love to have oh, horses. Okay. We have moose. We have moose instead. <laughs> so literally, we, I have. Yeah, I have videos just from the other day of two young bulls that are showing up now. So for the longest time, we would see one or the other, not realizing they were different because they're both very similar in size. Uh, we'd see them coming and going, mm -hmm. only one. And then this Saturday gone by, I seen like we literally get out of bed and there's the moose eating my lilac bushes. <laughs> And of course, the dog starts growling. So I knew something was in the yard. I didn't know if it was a rabbit. And here it was the moose. So while I'm taking pictures of one moose, I see another one coming. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, there's two. So there's oh. been two young bulls around. They were around the other night and they were around on the weekend. We have rabbits. We've got there's wildlife here everywhere. So being on a beautiful because my husband has magical hands and he works the land like nobody I've ever known. He's turned this property into a beautiful uh -huh. oasis. So we have beautiful grassy area. We're surrounded by trees. We have a beautiful gazebo tucked down in the corner in the woods. So for me, whenever I need to recharge, I go out, I get the sunlight. I've got my my own pets. <laughs> and if if yeah. there's wildlife around, I boot them in the house and let the wildlife be. Like we we try to get after these guys not to chase the wildlife, whether it be birds, animals, squirrels, whatever. But um, they're getting to the point yeah. where they're learning because even the rabbits, I can sit out in the chair and rabbits, wild rabbits will be around the property and the dogs won't even bother them. Like they just come out with us there. They're just used to us. And I think they're all having babies because they kind of vanish. <laughs> Aww. Get one and keep it for a pet. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> my daughter and husband are trying to map that out as we speak. <laughs> Because we just brought a house too and we on an acre and it's like our whole backyard is so big and we have nothing but woods back there. So it's like I'm just waiting on the time when the deers are just going to be at our back door. <laughs> like I'm just waiting. Absolutely. There's deer around. No, not as many as there was when we first moved here, but there's some deer around. The moose are, are more predominant than the deer here. But absolutely. And mm -hmm. it's it's so nice just to step out into your backyard and not have the loud noise of the city. And if, especially if you grew up in the country, which him and I both did, we grew up in the country. So we value and appreciate the quiet recharge. So to step out and hear all the different mm -hmm. birds chirping and to hear even cows, there's farmers around us. So even to hear the cows in the distance, I it doesn't bother me. But to step out and to have, you know, fresher air, <laughs> the sun, the nature all around and you. Like yeah. air, there's big, field of grass you can go get your feet and toes into the grass and just that in itself mm -hmm. is recharging like there's no better plug-in for me than nature right i love that now you got me ready to enjoy the because yeah i'm from the city where we hearing cars traffic all the time blowing but now since i'm in north carolina like it's very quiet and peaceful Yes. So I told so you it was just the nature. Yes. So think about what it was like when you were in the city. When you go home at night, how much more do you come down where you are now versus where you were? Like there's a level of stress that doesn't a come lot. away when you go home. Yeah. Yeah. It goes mm -hmm. to show mm -hmm. how and it's so impactful it is. Or, or, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when you stop. Because my, my mate real. also told me the other she told me the other day, she was like, you need to get up one morning and go outside, like literally like 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning and just hear the, like, hear the nature, like the birds and everything. She was like, it just sounds so good and relaxing. I was like, okay, I'm going to try to wake up at 6 one morning. <laughs> and watch the sunrise. I, like, I love watching the sunrise. Yeah, the sun rises and the sun sets. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I love it. And because it's never the same, no matter how often the sun sets and rises, it's never the same. And uh, it's getting harder now because yeah. like we get up early and we get up at typically quarter to five in the mornings and the sun, like it's all, it's pretty well daylight at that point now. So, you know, we're kind of missing some of the sunrises already, um, but the sunsets are still yeah. happening like between nine and 10. So we can still capture those, but you know, it's just a matter of time. We're not, 
I'm not going to see the sunset for a couple of months because I'll be in bed. <laughs> but uh, yeah. during the fall, it's absolutely beautiful. So as summer, once you get past that June 20th and things start to wind down again, like the latter part of August and into mm -hmm. September are beautiful months because the sun is setting and rising later. So you get to see the sunrises and the sunsets and you get to stargaze and you get to see the northern lights and you get to see the, you know, the shooting stars. I've seen more shooting stars here in the last two, two years we've been here than I have seen my entire life. And I grew up in the country, but I just never seen because of the, just where how Nova Scotia was, you know, the, the top of topography is very, um, high and low like there's a lot of hills and bumps so it's hard to see sky so they call western canada like big sky for a reason because things are more flat so you get more view of the sky here than what you do down east and uh so i mean we look up way more even the car cam caught a shooting star one day <laughs> we were driving into work in the winter time and we caught a shooting star on the, on the dash cam <laughs> oh wow that was i bet you that was so beautiful oh that was so cool but we've seen like quite a few big, <laughs> big, big shooting stars with big tails. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't see any of that stuff growing up, even though I was in the country. It just, yeah. Right. So let the people know how to find you, where to find you at, and um, tell them a little about yourself that you already did, but just let them know where to find you. <laughs> So I am pretty well on every social platform. So Facebook, um, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, all my platforms other than LinkedIn are all under my dynamic living lifestyles. So you'll find me under dynamic living lifestyles or Anne Oiko. I didn't put my name in the thing because most people can't pronounce it, <laughs> but Anne O-I-C-K-L-E. <laughs> and I do have my personal website under dynamic living lifestyles at nowsite.com or dot now site dot now dot site <laughs> it's so hard i mess that up every time <laughs> i need to get a dot com website <laughs> but it's uh yeah dynamic living dot, dot now dot site <laughs> and uh yeah like i'm on social media I, I share information and educational tips all the time on you know health and well-being um when it comes to the mental and emotional aspects on cellular health, because there's oh, there's mm -hmm. so much information that people don't understand. And it's unfortunate because our medical industry, period, focuses on symptoms. And the doctors will tell you that. I, you know, I, I had my daughter in emerge for a UTI and you know, I talked to him about, you know, where what could have caused it. And he's like, we don't deal with causes, we deal with symptoms. And they didn't even run her blood or her mm -hmm. urine. Like she she did the pee in the cup and they didn't even test it. And, you know, he's like, she, she's got this, what? that, UTI, here's medication. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but that's what they do. And uh, our medical system, is, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. They, they treat symptoms. And our entire medical system, and I'm sure it's the same way down the states. In some areas of the states, I know it's actually worse. <laughs> our medical systems are so backed mm -hmm. up because we went through a stage where they used to say people are living longer than they ever did. I think we're on the opposite side of that now where people are no longer living as long as they claim to be because there's so much sickness and illness yeah. and there's so many other factors involving that now, like our environment, the air we breathe is toxic. Now the foods, no matter how natural they are, are not a hundred percent natural anymore. So, you know, I even use Alberta mm -hmm. as an example. We're the land of farmland here, <clears throat> but the, the soil is dead there's there's not much natural nutrients in the soil anymore and even our our lot here we dug up the garden last year and normally you find like bugs and worms and a ton of stuff that keeps the soil rich it's not there <laughs> i yeah. could not get i could not get any vegetables to grow without buying manure in a bag which has chemicals in it and even the farmers the the fertilizers and stuff they use it's there to help the food grow faster and to and to tolerate and withstand what's what it's going to have to mm -hmm. deal with. So our foods are not even as natural as they used to be. Our milk is all pasteurized and processed. So our cheeses taste like look like and taste like rubber now. <laughs> they don't even have a ton of flavor anymore. So with our, our foods and our environment changing, we can't get past it. So being able to fuel our body mm -hmm. at the 
at the foundational level, which is ourselves, it only makes sense. So being able to educate people on that as well is huge and part of my mission. Um, so I post regularly around cellular health when we have information sessions, when we have events um, around the coaching and the mental health and tips and tricks and meditation. Because I, when people used to talk to me about meditating, I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> and now when I hear people say I can't do that, I'm like, mm. yes, you can. Because <laughs> I didn't think I could. Because right. my brain didn't stop. But you don't have to stop your brain. There's that misconception that you have to stop your brain. But you don't have to stop your brain. Over time, you learn to slow it down. My brain still goes when I meditate at times, just natural, but it's to understand it and catch it. I know. What I, is it? That's, that's why I stopped meditating because it's like every time I try to meditate, my, my mind still be talking and I'm like, shut yeah. up. No, so let I just her gave it up. Cause I was like, <laughs> Dr. Joe Dispenza, I, I absolutely <laughs> Yeah, no, I love that. I want to say thing. thank you for choosing. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say thank you for choosing Successful Toy Podcast to come on and share your story. And yes, you're welcome thank back you. anytime. Excellent. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> I thank you guys for tuning in. Yes, I love the conversation. You taught me some stuff about um gardening though, because I definitely was gonna start my own garden in the backyard, but now that you say that with the bugs and stuff and the earthworms, like you don't see them no more for real. No, no, you need to I just right noticed you when you Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna try mosquitoes. anyways though. I'm gonna try anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's up with the mosquitoes. There's plenty of them. <laughs> oh my god. Then the ants is there's plenty of ants over here. Oh my Jesus. Lord have mercy. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. <laughs> But I want to say thank you guys for tuning in. This was a great conversation and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thank you for joining us on today's journey with the Successful Toy Podcast. Before we part, remember to empower your success journey with our exclusive Are You Successful merchandise and arm yourself with insights from our free ebook, 10 Things People Don't Tell You When You're Running a Business, available on Linktree forward slash Successful Toy Podcast. And if you've got a story the world needs to hear, we want to feature you. Reach out to us at SuccessfulToy at gmail.com to discuss becoming a guest on the show. Until next time, keep innovating, and here's to your success.